their mortality rates were not necessarily better than ours, but what they also found was if you made it to 50 years old, the chances of making it to 80 or 90 were almost exactly the same as exactly. Westerners, but without all the health issues. So they never had hypertension, they rarely had heart disease, and it was very rare to find a cancer. <laughs> Welcome to the Fundamental Health Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Paul Saladino. This podcast is the result of my relentless search to understand and correct the roots of chronic disease and illness. In this podcast, I will share with you everything I have learned about how to live the most healthy and radical life possible. Thanks for joining me on this journey. What's going on, you guys? We are another week closer to the release of the Carnivore Code. I'm so stoked. It sets release on February the 11th. You can still pre-order it. It should be available on Amazon for pre-order soon, but you can pre-order it on my website, thecarnivorecodebook.com, which is on carnivoremd.com, where you can also sign up for my newsletter. Check that out. And if you like this podcast, if you like what I am doing here, if you want to help me share this message if you find value in what I do, please leave me a review on iTunes or whatever space you listen to podcasts. Help me promote this. The podcast is doing awesome. We are growing very rapidly. And this World Carnivore Month is going awesome. I hope you guys are having a great one, whether you are doing a carnivore diet or a ketogenic diet or whatever kind of diet you're doing. I hope you're doing great this month. But it's uh, it's been a good month for the carnivore movement. And I'm super excited to be releasing my book, at the end of it, at the beginning of next month. This week's podcast was an awesome one. I got to have a friend of mine who is quite a luminary in the space of anti-aging, autophagy, mTOR. This is James Clement, who is well known for founding Better Humans, which is the first uh, transhumanist biomedical research organization. And you also may know him from his work with the Super Centenarian Research Study, which he started in 2010 with Professor George Church at Harvard and has received international press coverage. As we talk about on this podcast, James is pretty much obsessed with understanding uh, how humans age, how we can age better, how to leverage autophagy for life extension and quality of life, and I mean obsessed in the best way. So I think you guys are really going to dig this one. I challenged him with a lot of questions. I definitely asked him what he thought of a carnivore diet, and we had some good back and forth discourse. I really like making this podcast not an echo chamber, and it was good to hear his perspective. He is really on the more of the plant-based side than I am, and so I wanted to offer some counterpoints to his hesitations regarding animal protein, and I think you will be excited to hear those nuances of the conversation. I think you guys will also be excited to hear that White Oak Cella 2020 is coming, you guys. It is the first weekend in May. We're going to be announcing the official stuff this week. It's May 2nd and 3rd, which is a Saturday, Sunday. At the beginning of May, it's going to be in Bluffton, Georgia at White Oak Pastures. You guys have heard me talk about this farm. They are leading the way in regenerative agriculture. This is the conversation that I believe will turn the tide in the realm of environmental politics, environmental advocacy, animal-based nutrition, because when you can be carbon negative, as White Oak Pastures has been demonstrated to be by life cycle analyses, we can sequester more carbon into the soil than we are producing when we are growing and farming cows and other ruminants. This is clearly the best thing we can do. Plant-based burgers do not do this. Monocrop agriculture does not do this. These are carbon positive things. So in order to really change the quality of an ecosystem, we need to have animals grazing on the land in a regenerative fashion. It's rotational grazing, it's composting back into the soil. And when you guys come to Bluffton, Georgia next year to White Oak Cella, you will see this is the greenest grass I have seen in a very long time and some of the most beautiful and healthy animals that I have encountered on a farm. And they are cared for by some of the most conscientious and forward-thinking people I've met in a long time. It's a great community. I want to see you guys there. As you guys know, White Oak Pasture is 
making grass fed, grass finished in the realest, real, real, real sense of the word, meat and organs. Uh, And they also have lamb and turkey and duck and chicken eggs and guinea, all kinds of good stuff. You can find it all at whiteoakpastures.com. You can use the code CARNIVOREMD for 10% off your first order. You can also go to info.whiteoakpastures.com front slash carnivore md for my landing page there which will have specials for this month which will include oxtail it will include beef bones and it will include white oak pastures own gelatin and beef broth january is the month of stock it's like winter in most parts of the country it's beautiful in san diego right now but in most parts of the country it's winter and you can get stuff to make good nourishing bone broth from white oak pastures these are probably the best bones that you'll find they're from the cleanest, most well-nourished cows I've ever seen. Like I said, you can use the code carnivore15 for 15% off those items which are on special this month. I'm so excited about these people, you guys. I can't wait to see you guys at White Oak Cella 2020. I'm also super excited that this podcast continues to be sponsored by my people at Ancestral Supplements, www.ancestralsupplements.com. They are making grass-fed, grass-finished, freeze-dried organ supplements from animals raised in the pristine lands of New Zealand, and they encapsulate them into a gelatin capsule, which makes it so much easier for those of us to take that don't want to eat the organ meats or can't access the organ meats or are traveling and have trouble putting brain in our backpack when we're traveling. That may be my problem, not yours, but it is something that I run into and I like eating brain and other parts of the animal. So this is such a convenient solution. One of the coolest things that Ancestral Supplements has done recently is introduce a tallow product. They've incorporated grass-fed, grass-finished animal fat into a capsule, which you can either chew like a little fat, gummy, candy-ish thing, or you can combine with organ meats that have fat-soluble nutrients, and they will be more better absorbed. More better absorbed. Mo better absorbed. And you can also combine the tallow with other ancestral supplements products, and it will help with the absorption of the fat-soluble nutrients in those, things like vitamin K2, vitamin A, vitamin E, et cetera, et cetera. So check out ancestralsupplements.com. They're also coming out with an eye supplement, which I'm pretty stoked about. And I want to get some people on the podcast soon to talk about age-related macular degeneration. But I so appreciate the work that the people, the men and women uh, at Ancestral Supplements are doing. They are jumping in cold water in Houston, Texas this time of year. They are crushing CrossFit workouts. They are doing barbarian workouts. And you should follow them on social media at Ancestral Supplements and see the kind of stuff they are doing because they walk the walk, they talk the talk, but they live it, you guys. And um, I'm so happy to support their work because it makes getting organs much more accessible for the majority of us in certain situations. You can use the code SALADINOMD at their Shopify site for 10% off, www.ancestralsupplements.com. They are putting back in what the modern world has left out. The last sponsor of this podcast is Native Deodorant because we don't want to smell like caveman when we're trying to live like our ancestors. You know how it goes. And what's so cool about Native, as you guys will know, I am not a fan of personal care products that have added parabens, phthalates, etc. This is formulated without aluminum, parabens, and talc. It is filled with ingredients that are found in nature, coconut oil, shea butter, and tapioca starch, things that are never tested on animals. They have free shipping and returns, and it works. It's an aluminum-free deodorant that does not leave you smelling funky at the office. It will, Like I said, it will not leave you smelling like a caveman or cavewoman, and it will also not have the bad stuff in it, the xenoestrogens that we do not want. And they have over 8,000 five-star reviews, 8,000 five-star reviews. And they are a pretty cool company doing things with simpler ingredients that will help us smell like fresh ancestral humans living radical, radical lives. They have all sorts of cool scents, coconut and vanilla, which is the most popular, lavender and rose, cucumber and mint, eucalyptus and mint, and they offer free returns and exchanges in the U.S. I use their stuff, and I found it to be quite effective, and it smells pretty good. People were not running away from me, and nobody noticed that I was smelling badly. In fact, I said that I smelled great. So you can use the code SALADINO at their website, which is nativedeodorant.com, the code SALADINO, S-A-L-A-D-I-N-O, for 20% off your first purchase. And check them out. 
you will appreciate this more natural deodorant. Your armpits will appreciate this more natural deodorant. Your hormones will appreciate this more natural deodorant. And probably most of the people around you will appreciate this more natural deodorant. I appreciate what they're doing. And I love that we can get personal care stuff that is not full of weirdness. So anyway, on to the podcast, you guys. I appreciate you all so much. Listen after the show for what is going on with me. All right, we're live. James Clement, thanks for coming on the podcast, my friend. It's good to have you here. Thanks, Paul. It's really nice to be invited. Looking forward to talking with you. We've got lots of fun stuff to talk about. I think that as we were talking about before the podcast, there's a lot of stuff that we are going to see eye to eye on, and there may be a few things that we disagree on. So we'll try and offer some point and counterpoint on that stuff and highlight some of these things. But the research that you're doing and that you're involved in is, is very interesting for me and for many of our colleagues who include Joe Mercola and others. So let's just start off with a little bit of that kind of stuff. What kind of research are you doing? What are you interested in? And how does this relate to aging? Well, uh, aging really is a center uh, focus for me. Um, I started with uh, Gert Pearson and Sandy Shaw's book in 1982, Life Extension, a Practical Scientific Approach. And that really sort of hooked me on the concept. Uh, and um, in the early 2000s, I started attending scientific conferences and medical conferences about aging. Um, got connected with uh, George Church, a geneticist at Harvard Medical School. Uh, was on the board of one of his startup companies that did the first direct-to-consumer genome uh, sequencing. And started talking to him about longevity. And it turned out that he was an advocate for extending healthy human lifespan. Mm -hmm. And he and I together started something called the Supercentenarian Research Study. And I spent um, about three years going around the U.S. and the U.K. and E.U. collecting blood samples from eventually 60 people, 106 to 112 years of age. And that was really just an incredibly eye-opening experience to see people who were 109 years old and driving 900 miles in their sports car to go to a 80 year old daughter's uh, birthday party uh, living on their own and this was numerous uh, men and women that were in really fantastic shape and then had a very short um, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, down cycle where they uh, I think mostly got pneumonia and uh, you know died of, um, of uh, pneumonia um, so it, it taught me a lot about what healthy aging might look like. And of course, George and I have projects um, uh, involving what would, what would living past 120 require. And a lot of my current research is, is based on that. And I've heard this described as squaring of the mortality curve or compression of morbidity. And it's something that I think appears to be observed in indigenous peoples, maybe not at 109 years old, but at their, when they die, you know, indigenous people, I think are often misunderstood, but the, at least within modern history, in indigenous people that we've studied, um, when they do die, they, or their mortality curve appears to be squared as well. And this means that they maintain vitality longer in their life. In the West, what we know is we have this sort of steady decline in our vitality for lack of a more objective measure and you know functionality lean muscle mass um, our ability to be a functional human and in indigenous cultures we see that all those metrics kind of stay more level and then drop off precipitously when they die right this is the compression of morbidity and i think this is the same thing that you're describing it is and and i spent a lot of time uh going back and reading uh late 1800s to mid 1900 uh 1990s um, papers of individuals that went to um, exotic islands and, and uh, Arctic Circle and reported back on the health of people that are living what I would call closer to the land. Right. So not, not living off of grocery store food, flour, sugar, um, oils, etc. that you would find in so-called Western civilization and diets. Uh, and the further they got from these um, civilizing factors, uh, the healthier they were. So a lot of doctors in the early uh, 1900s were referring to 
uh, the Western diet as the diseases of civilization. Diabetes, um, Alzheimer's, heart disease, and cancer. And the primary reason was they didn't see this in indigenous populations. Um, they were suffering from things that we had cured with antibiotics and, and other drugs like infectious disease. And of course, you know, they, they were also experiencing uh, famines and, and um, uh, interruptions in um, their life cycle that, that we wouldn't normally experience. Um, so their, their mortality rates were not necessarily better than ours, but what they also found was if you made it to 50 years old, the chances of making it to 80 or 90 were almost exactly the same as exactly. Westerners, but without all the health issues. So they never had hypertension, they rarely had heart disease, and it was very rare to find a cancer um, in these individuals. I think that's so fascinating, and I think it's such an important point to point out so many people will lump all of the mortality data for these people together and say their life expectancy is lower than ours. But that statistic that you note, which is that if you make it to 50 years old, you have the same chance of making it to 80 or a full life, quote unquote, as we would view in Western society. And as you point out, it's so important without the morbidity that we experience, without the decline in vitality. And that is so key. People in plant-based circles will often point to indigenous hunter-gatherers or they'll say cavemen only live to be 25 years old. And I just think this is such an inaccurate representation of the quality of life that indigenous peoples can uh, experience. And it probably has to do with the differences in their diet and lifestyle, which we can get into. And I think that it's such an interesting question to try and tease out what it is about the differences in those lifestyles and what they were eating that is so powerful and everybody kind of speculates and i may have a little bit different perspective than someone else but i think that there is much value to be had there but as we have seen there is so much skewing of the data regarding these people's life expectancies that comes from higher infant mortality infectious disease when they're young sanitation issues straight famine getting killed by animals and and when we get rid of that data and we sort of um, re qualify or recalculate the data looking at a more level playing field or reasonable landscape, we see something quite interesting, which is this squaring of the mortality curve, this compression yeah. of morbidity. There's something very, very interesting there as well. So that's important to point out. And, and it's often something that I want to express in rebuttal to those who would argue that um, caveman life, that you know, cavemen didn't live a long time. And it's like, well, if we're using indigenous peoples as any indication, um, if they got to 50 years old without getting eaten by a saber-toothed tiger, falling off a cliff, um, having an infectious disease, or dying in infancy or childbirth, they were probably going to be pretty darn healthy, healthier than us. I agree, 100%. And I've, I've been surprised, um, you know, I would read papers that were, um, I would say, biased in one direction or another. So, you know, uh, a study that was about uh, vegan diets or, or uh, you know, had a similar uh, outlook. And they would quote, um, for example, um, a study that I think was published around, uh, it was the early 1900s, so 1919 to 1925, let's say, and about um, indigenous people in the northeast of Canada, uh, which they referred to as Eskimos. And, um, and the article is cited over and over in other scientific papers, and of course, a lot of books, et cetera, for the proposition that eating fish did not help these people um, with cardiovascular health. And so I went back through all these references to find the original paper and to read it, and it's absolutely clear um, and basically reported by the doctors who made these visits that they were lumping in together all of the um, uh, Eskimos that lived around the Hudson Strait and were essentially uh, trading with Westerners and getting lots of flour and sugar and coffee, and also the ones that were in remote locations. And right in the paper, they say, the further you got away from civilization, the healthier these people were. They weren't, they weren't consuming refined carbohydrates, and that seemed to be the biggest factor uh, in them. And 
for these people that were living primarily off of, off of fish and not um, flour and sugar, um, they found that um, they had virtually no cardiovascular disease. And the same thing uh, has been reported from doctors in Alaska of the Inuit population. Um, so I really not only opened my eyes to this diseases of civilization problem, but also the fact that people cherry pick information um, and then they, they perpetuate the myth that what these papers actually stand for. It's so, it's so difficult. Um... And I hope that's what we're both a part of is showing people the nuance in the data and helping to un, um, un, uncover the truth. I think that it's very difficult for any one person to know all of the truth. But one of the things that I'm very interested in is just helping people understand what is probably really true and how much misleading information is actually out there. Uh, we all have our biases, admittedly, but this is the type of nuance that is often lost in cherry pick data or people who are using this to support a certain agenda. They've observed the same thing in the Maasai in Africa, that they have this compression of morbidity. And so there's definitely happens in the Arctic populations, but even in populations that are eating large amounts of animal foods in Africa, they have a similar compression of morbidity. And it's often said, oh, well, the Maasai had atherosclerosis. Well, the problem with that study is, again, it's the nuance, right? When you actually look at the study in the Maasai where they did angiography or autopsy, they were looking at many of the Maasai who had died and were older than 40 years old. And so in Maasai culture, and I talked about this on a podcast I did with Chris uh, Masterjohn, the warrior class of men are the only class that still eat a traditional diet, which is uh, milk and blood and animal meat as their primary food source, and they really shun plants. But once they're past 40 years old, their diet shifts to be much more westernized. And so it's, it's really recapitulating what you're, what you're suggesting here with the Eskimo. They're lumping them all together. And there's a real misunderstanding of what's going on. And they'll say, see, look, the, the Maasai got atherosclerosis. Well, the people they were looking at an autopsy were not eating the traditional Maasai diet. And um, there's a real shift. And unless we can really separate those populations, these things are so hard to really make judgments based on. Agreed. They, they, uh, so there's been lots of studies where um, individuals followed people who immigrated from Okinawa to Honolulu and San Diego, and they found that basically after just uh, five to 10 years of eating Western-style diets, um, that they were just as unhealthy as, as you know, the, the uh, populations of Honolulu and San Diego as compared to Okinawa. Um, the same has been done at Papua New Guinea, where, um, you know, they were protected by New Zealand, and New Zealand offered, essentially, citizenship to, to anyone that wanted to come to New Zealand, and immediately they saw, like, their health deteriorate as they become westernized in their lifestyle uh, habits. Um, so I, I completely agree that, you know, this happens during the life. Um, if you change from a traditional what I like to call uh, close to the land diet um, and become more westernized and eat a lot of highly refined carbohydrates and, and uh, um, CAFO, um, you know, uh, high omega-6 meats and things like that, chances are that, that uh, your uh, morbidity and mortality risk is gonna match everybody else that follows the so-called sad uh, standard American diet. Yeah, the CAFO is the clustered animal feeding. So it's the concentrated animal feeding operations that you're talking about, which is essentially feedlot meat, which listeners of this podcast will know I'm no fan of. But I completely agree with you. And I think that we should just dwell on this point for one more moment to really emphasize it, to drive this point home for people, because this is really what my whole podcast is about. Even though I'm quite interested in animal-based diets, I don't think that it has, to, I don't think that it has to be quite that, um, uh, that's specific to even get the majority of the benefit. I think the majority of the benefit in a human diet will come from exactly what you are suggesting, um, eliminating processed food. And this will probably come as no surprise to anyone listening, but it cannot be repeated enough times that I think that the majority of the change in the health of these people and the health of us as humans is processed food. Well, what is processed food? Well, we may all define this differently, but I think of it as, like you said, refined carbohydrates, uh, vegetable oils, so seed oils, and I, in some ways, I would consider feedlot beef to be a processed food uh, 
Um, mm -hmm. And and we I don't think that we know how that is really helping or hurting you know human health. But certainly the first two I think are are far and away absolutely clear. Um, processed carbohydrates and seed vegetable oils. And I think that if we avoid those two things as a very simple thing, we will do so much better. And if we want to avoid feedlot meat, that's a great thing. And like you said, if we can just get back to the land um, and eating a simple quote unquote nature-based diet or a whole foods diet, I think we're going to do much better. And then, you know, beyond that, there's nuance in terms of how to best construct that. And we'll get into that a little bit later in the podcast. But um, I just want people to hear that, that we totally agree on that. And I think that's such an important piece of this. And um, it's, it's so easy, right? It's so easy. Yeah. And the other thing that I worry about sometimes is that I, and we'll get into this too in the podcast, but I would almost consider many supplements to be processed food. So this is a nuance, right? Like what's in the supplements and how do we use them properly and stuff? So I, I, as much as I can, I strive to get, you know, the food that's closest to the land as we can. Yeah. yeah. So when going back to the, your survey of super centenarians, and these are people that are older than a hundred and you said older than 110 or close. Older than 110 or 110 and older is the definition of a super centenarian. Um, my study was primarily funded by uh, elderly men. So they wanted me to study uh, supercentenarian men. And as it turns out, um, supercentenarian women outnumber men 15 to 1. Wow. So I actually had to end up dropping the age down to 106 so that we would even out the population to about 50 50. And um, unfortunately, uh, what I found was that women could suffer um, having had cancer in their 80s and pulled through and made it to 112. But the men that made it to 109 and 10 and passed never had a thing wrong with them ever in their life. Mm. In fact, most of them, I was the first person they'd ever seen that asked for a blood sample from them of any kind. They'd never even seen a doctor before. There's the answer, seen, right? I have, some, I have some great stories about, you know, these people uh, and what they recall. But, um, you know, um, it, it was again, really eye-opening to, to see people that were living that um, squared mortality curve. And in the book, you talk about the numbers of these people. I think I saw this in your interview with Dr. Mercola that 120,000 people might live to the age of 100, but a, a, a much smaller fraction make it to 110. What is the number? Like, uh, well, in the US, it's about 20 to 30 at the most. People at so one it's time. A, it's a huge drop-off. And a lot of people can make it to 100, although uh, sadly for a great percentage of the population, that's not the case, right? Median age for men and women, you know, is in the uh, low 80s, uh, if not lower. And some of that's affected by, you know, uh, teenage accidents and drug abuse and things like that. So, so those numbers are skewed also, right? It's not, we don't really look at the population that make it to 50, what's the median average then? Um, so that would be interesting to see. And I just haven't come across, you know, that kind of research, but, um, uh, uh, sorry, totally <laughs> lost my train of thought. No, no, let's talk Hopefully about, let's talk out. about the, um, the similarities in those people, because in the book, you mentioned a couple of genes, FOXO3 and IGF1, but before we get into the genes and maybe just a story or two, I want to get into the hard science. Cause I know that's what my audience loves, but in the, you know, like, what did you observe similarly between these people at the end of your book, which is called The Switch, which is coming out, which is out, will be out when this podcast comes out. You have a, a, a series of sayings from people who are super centenarians, things you learned from them. But like, you know, what are some of the things that you found them have in common in general? Well, for one thing, I never met an obese or tall super centenarian. The women were exceptionally short. So right around five foot to five two, um, and very lightweight. Um, the men that I met were definitely shorter than the average uh, man that you would meet, even an 80 year old man. Um, so one of the things that the top researchers of centenarians, um, such as Nir Barzilai, Tom Pearls, and Stuart Kim have found is that they have what's called loss of 
function mutations, which means that they make proteins that don't quite work as well, let's put it, as uh, normal um, genes, uh, particularly in the uh, IGF-1 and growth hormone areas. So if you step back and look at, at IGF-1, um, there's only one gene that makes the difference between like a Doberman pincer and a miniature pincer. Um, so huge difference in size and huge difference in lifespan. Um, the, the miniatures of any species, whether it's mice or dogs or, or other animals, um, actually live substantially longer than the full version. And this is generally caused by growth hormone or IGF-1 um, limitations. Um, I talk about a group of people in the book called um, Laurent syndrome uh, dwarfs, and they have a particular genetic um, mutation that, that basically also limits their IGF-1 growth hormone levels, and in fact, completely protects them from diabetes and cancer. No one's ever known in this population of a, you know, three to 400 individuals around the world um, to have died of cancer. And uh, you don't see them getting Alzheimer's as well. Um, unfortunately, they do all kinds of risky things and they don't eat, most of them smoke. So um, in spite of not getting cancer, um, they're not really very healthy people. And so their lifespans aren't um, sort of what we would hope for. But the amazing thing is just this one single mutation completely protects them from diabetes and cancer. It's quite interesting. And I, I talk about the Laron Dwarves in my book as well, which is coming out in February. And I, I think that you, you make sure to make this point in the book that IGF-1 is not all bad and we need some of this anabolic signaling. And we'll talk about that. But people with the Laron syndrome, the Laron Dwarves, also have problems with sleep and they have problems with uh, many and they're very short. And so we know that growth hormone and the IGF signaling pathway is needed for other things that are valuable in the human body. We can't completely abolish it, nor would we want to, but it is an, it's such an interesting insight that there's something going on here. My takeaway with regard to IGF-1, and you can let me know if you agree with this, um, is that we don't want to overstimulate it, which is really what your book, The Switch, is all about with both mTOR and IGF-1, um, you know, which are connected intimately, that we don't want to overdo it, and we should be aware of which things turn these genes on and off. Um, interestingly, I'll mention that um, when I've checked my IGF-1 on a carnivore diet, which may be surprising for you, it's pretty low. It's at least one standard deviation below the mean. So the Z-score, just like people will get a DEXA scan for bone density and they'll give you a, a mean, uh, and then they'll give you a Z-score, which is how many standard deviations you are above or below the mean. The Z-score that I see in my clients on a carnivore diet and, uh, and myself is, is usually below the mean. Sometimes it's more than a standard deviation below the mean, which is quite interesting because, um, and this is kind of, I think, what'll be interesting about our conversation as it evolves today, many people are now um, concerned about animal foods, overstimulating IGF-1. And I think there's some nuance here for people to know that it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. Um, so I guess I, um, I'll throw it back to you. So. Would you agree with those statements that we just we don't want to overstimulate IGF-1? It's an important thing, and we should probably have a sense of where we are on the IGF-1 curve and be checking that metric frequently. Absolutely. Um, you know, there's a saying that if you can't measure something, you can't improve it. And um, having feedback on where numerous different levels are, whether it's blood sugar levels or IGF-1 levels, etc., is going to be really important in the future for people to micromanage, if you will, um, this uh, switch that we talk about in, uh, in my book. And uh, you've sort of led to, to what the book is about because um, it's very much about the balance that we need to restore uh, of these two states of uh, the anabolic state versus the catabolic state. And I find that these modern Western diets have basically slammed the accelerator onto growth and never takes into account that we evolve to experience famine. 
And some of the benefits that we get from the processes that are turned on when our body is deprived of nutrients is that it cleans out a lot of really bad things, toxic proteins, misfolded proteins, dysfunctional organelles, and the reverse of that being essentially overfed, overnutritioned, and keeping mTOR, this anabolic state of growth turned on all the time, means that we never repair ourselves. And that, I believe, is what gives rise to these diseases of civilization, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, and Alzheimer's. I agree with you. I totally agree with you with regard to that. And I think it's so it's so interesting and it's so nuanced. And so what we know is that by eating all the time, by eating at all hours of the day, by snacking, by not having a time-restricted feeding window, hopefully we'll get into all this, and by eating a mix of different foods all the time, we are always pressing the accelerator on mTOR and never getting enough autophagy, right? It's like the buzzword, right? right. Autophagy. And I like that in the book, you, you note that we need to have some of both. There's a brake and an accelerator in every car. You don't just get in your car and smash the brake and go anywhere, nor would we as humans. And as we see, if we don't have enough of the accelerator, we will be very short. We will have sleep problems like Laurent Dorves. There are benefits to that, but I think we can, what we're trying to do here is really be precise and nuanced. And just like we were considering with the indigenous people, take the best from both worlds, right? Understand how to do both in the best way that we can. Um, I think that, that we can, if we can marry the two uh, civilizations, because right now we know how to prevent infectious disease and we have sanitation and infant mortality is, is rare and we know which foods we need to get micronutrients and we don't experience famine very often unless we're in a very dire strait financially. And so we can avoid all the things that they died of and if we can now avoid all the things that we are dying of, we can have the best of both worlds. And I think, you're, I think you're right. I think that what is killing us now is, is the foods we're eating and how we're eating them. And um, there's some nuance there that I think is important to kind of flesh out too. Just going back to the centenarians, I want to highlight something that I saw in your book, which was that a lot of them also had lifestyle habits, right? They played and they said that they wanted, they said, stay busy and have a community. This is what you observed, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I think that's a huge part of this. And we'll probably get into the blue zones in Okinawa and Loma Linda as we continue the conversation. Um, so if we talk about IGF-1, before we move on from this, in my practice, what I think is valuable for people is to check IGF-1 frequently. And I would check a fasting IGF-1. Do you ever check postprandial IGF-1? Do you find there's any utility to that measure as well? So um, we haven't really done that kind of research. And uh, what I found in scientific research that I've you know, studied is that it's almost always fasting levels. Um, so uh, it would be interesting to get a round the clock, um, you know, picture of how IGF-1 levels change, sort of like the, uh, um, the continuous glucose monitors that people have, being able to measure IGF-1 levels. But the good news, if you wanna look at it this way, is that there's lots of populations, not just the uh, Paleolithic people, not just the hunter-gatherers, but actual, essentially modern people living in, in Italy, Japan, uh, and America that we can look to who are living lifestyles and diets that are closer to the land in the sense of, you know, they're not coming out of grocery stores. And in fact, in, in a lot of these places, it's hard to even find a grocery store. Uh, so um, uh, one of the things that, that I think is important is to realize that um, we don't have to just look at, at uh, man-made clinical trials. There's whole groups of populations out there that follow diets that I think both you and I would advocate or at least not find a lot of fault with. And, um, and in their own way, they're showing us that this greatly reduces these um, diseases of civilization, which are the ones that are making life unbearable for decades for many senior citizens and they don't get this uh, squaring of the mortality curve where they're literally uh, riding the bicycle or playing tennis up until the day they die at you know 106 or more yeah and while we're talking about that i guess maybe we should just dive into it i think that there um 
much of what's been talked about with regard to people throughout the world who live long amounts of time, this is kind of Dan Buettner's Blue Zones, um, which is something that I, I debunk in my book. I actually am not a fan of his research. I think it was cherry picked, unfortunately. And we can talk about why I, uh, I, I'm not so excited about it and maybe how you feel about the research in general. I agree with you. I think that looking across populations is valuable. And I think we have to be very careful as we do that because it's just, it's a, it's a territory that is very rife, ripe for cherry picking, right? Um, yeah. For instance, um, there are many people throughout the world who eat lots of meat who live a long time, right, as a population. So the Okinawans, Icelandic peoples, um, we, we, it doesn't, I think it's overly simplified for people to say that the blue zones or regions of the world with exceptional longevity are all about limiting meat. Um, and what I have seen in, in my research is that what's probably happening in these places, is the similarities between them are uh, the lifestyle, right? And this was something you noted in the book. People are playing, they have community, they're doing things, they're staying active. And what we see is that none of these places are eating processed foods, so that's good, generally speaking, but a lot of them are eating different diets. Some of them actually appear to be meat heavy diets. And um, I personally worry that a demonization of meat or, um, to, to suggest that a plant-based diet is the only way to achieve longevity will have negative health consequences in other ways. Um, so I'll throw it back to you. Well, I certainly have friends who are, who are vegans that eat an incredibly unhealthy vegan diet. You know, uh, one of them was arguing with me that um, uh, having white rice, uh, pasta, or um, sodas were completely vegan and therefore should be okay. Uh, and as a vegan, you know, they, they could even eat uh, candy bars because there was no meat or dairy in uh, the candy that they was eating. And, um, you know, that, that's the kind of outlook that um, basically makes every diet um, uh, unhealthy, is that you can't just go by a term and say, okay, I'm, I'm gonna eat only meat, but I'm gonna eat like 4,000 calories of meat and fat, you know, all day long, and I'm not, not gonna do any exercise. And, you know, um, these, these people that I follow all tell me I must be getting healthier because, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a carnivore. Um, so I really think you can ruin almost any diet if you try. Yeah, um, I agree. And, uh, and, and you, you do have to know, um, in my case, I think knowing the molecular biology really helps people make decisions later on. And so that's why a good deal of the book in the beginning is about this molecular switch that is inside our cells and what turns it off, what turns it on, and how to manipulate that through our diet primarily, but, but other things manipulated as well. So I talk about intermittent hypoxia. Um, and you know, I've been criticized by a couple of people because I, I definitely don't recommend smoking. <laughs> but you do notice that that a lot of centenarians and even super centenarians smoked every day of their life, <laughs> um, basically. And you know, uh, John Calment and um, Mortensen, uh, a male, um, he smoked cigars every single day. I think he had one or two cigars. Um, Walter Brunin, uh, also an American, smoked one cigar every day until he was about 108. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's entirely possible that, okay, they have a yet unknown genetic um, mutation that allows them to do things that would otherwise be unhealthy and not bother them. But it's also possible that they're simply having this small amount of carbon monoxide that cigarettes and cigars, et cetera, produce. And because these were not, you know, pack a day smokers, Jean Calment, the woman who lived to 122, said she smoked two ciggies a day. And um, uh, uh, other reports about her said basically that, you know, if she was actually breathing any of this in, you couldn't tell. So, um, you know, they weren't heavy smokers by any means, but, you know, was, uh, turning off and turning on autophagy uh, via uh, intermittent hypoxia part of you know, their secret. We don't, we don't know. And it's unlikely anyone's gonna do those experiments, 
because of how negative you know the attitude is towards um, um, smoking. And and again, I'm not I'm certainly not recommending that people um, do this. It's just interesting that it's another way of turning on autophagy, another way of repairing and clearing out bad things from your cells, um, which is um, uh, noted in both long long lived species of uh, bowhead whales, which live up to 250 years of age, and they're a mammal, and uh, naked mole rats. So they both experience both intermittent um, hypoxia and intermittent fasting. And, you know, uh, to a great degree, this is what um, turns down uh, mTOR and turns up autophagy. So the, the book is really focused on doing this cycle back and forth. And, and I definitely want to talk to you about why it's important to keep mTOR turned up and not just, as you put it, put the brake on uh, mTOR all the time, saying uh, basically, you know, if autophagy is good, I want to do it all the time. Because I've had a number of friends that read about metformin or rapamycin or fasting. And so they basically said, I'm going to do this as much as I can. And then they saw their immune system tanking and their muscles uh, completely shrinking um, and essentially becoming um, or, or getting uh, sarcopenia. Right. Which so, we know is, yeah. So I told them that that you know this is you know you can't you can't say um, complete water fasting has been shown to have lots of health benefits, which it has, and then say. So I'm going to do it every day the rest of my life. I'm only going to have water from now on. I, I'm going to be the healthiest person around, right? Until you're dead. Right. <laughs> Until you're sarcopenic, frail, and dead. No, clearly there's a very delicate balance here. And I love that you point this out in the book that over fasting, over autophagizing, I just made that up, over autophagizing will deplete stem cells. And so the question yeah. becomes, where is the balance? And I, we touched on this earlier, and I think that the the ancestral wisdom is clear here. It's occasional famine, you know, and how much is up for debate. It's certainly, I think we do have, we need famine sometimes and famine can be a, uh, you know, a, a, a metric or a model of different ways of eating, intermittent fasting, prolonged fasting, but we can overdo it. And people need to be measuring things right. on both ends. As you said, if you're not measuring it, you can't quantify it, you can't correct it. And so I just want to, I'll wrap up the IGF-1 thing for people. I think that people should be checking IGF-1 regularly. I would recommend testing, checking fasting IGF-1. And I would love for you or someone to make a continuous glucose, IGF-1, and insulin meter, which will revolutionize healthcare. And like I said, I like to see IGF-1 levels fasting that are below the mean. I've got to believe that if we have a mean level of IGF-1, we are doing what everyone else does. We don't want a mean level of IGF-1. We want a level of IGF-1 in fasting that is below the mean. And I see it all the time in people on carnivore diets. And so you can look at the lab ranges. I believe the mean off the top of my head is like 140. And yeah. I, will, I will often see 90s, uh, 110, 120. And uh, we'll get into how that works. But I think that's a good metric for people because we don't really have a laboratory measure of mTOR, do we? No, not a laboratory measure. Um, I, I think IGF-1 is probably a good stand-in. Um, but again, I don't think a sufficient amount of research has been done to show um, that maybe two days out of every 10, let's say, uh, you shouldn't try and pump up your IGF-1 and uh, you know, eat a lot of branch chain amino acids that would really push that accelerator and hopefully restore stem cells um, replenish your immune system and build more muscle because this is how we evolved. Um, so you know, steak, let's just be very clear. You're talking about eating steak, <laughs> like branch chain amino acids, steak, <laughs> right? It, 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 I mean, it, it, it's true that that's where branch chain amino acids come from. So, um, you can supplement with, um, uh, BCAAs. Uh, you can, you can actually buy leucine powder, which is the number one, um, uh, activator of mTOR uh, and add it to an otherwise, you know, vegan shake if you want. But the point is, is that uh, the, um, the 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 switch needs to be turned off sometimes and turned on sometimes. 
And I tried to come up with a formula that I think was based mostly on the evidence that there is of how we evolved. And, you know, a lot of us at least uh, are descended from uh, populations from Northern Europe. And of course, you know, they experienced a 20,000 year ice age. Um, and it's no, this, this is something you probably talked about, but it's, it's no coincidence that all the extremely large mammals like woolly mammoths, uh, woolly uh, elephants, and uh, giant sloths all disappeared at this time um, because um, this was a way for people to get very quick energy from, uh, uh, you know, large deposits of fat, large deposits of bone marrow, uh, brain and organs, which were really easy to consume and didn't require, you know, extensive cooking. Um, so I think, I think Paleolithic man probably lived a lot more off of fat than we give them credit for it as well. Um, there's certainly discussions even in, um, 18th century uh, pioneers that, um, like the Lewis and Clark expedition, for example, they talked about uh, game such as rabbit and deer that were so lean that they couldn't eat them. Exactly. And, and they really wanted fatty food um, because that gave them, you know, it's twice as many uh, calories per gram of fat than it is for protein or, or vegetables. So they could get their caloric intake much easier living on a high fat diet. Um, so I, th I think there's um, a lot to be learned by um, both what we're discovering from paleolithic nutrition, but also more recently with people that weren't exposed to, you know, endless grocery stores and now the convenience of basically uh, going on a website and getting food delivered right to your house uh, on a daily basis. Pretty big problem. Yeah, I agree. I want to circle back to the cigarettes thing because I know it's going to be controversial. I don't think either James or I are advocating for smoking cigarettes, but it is an illustration of what I would call environmental hormesis. I am not a fan of molecular hormesis, which is the use of plant compounds for hormetics. I think that there's compelling data that we can get all of the hormesis we need from environmental exposures. Um, I'm not recommending cigarettes, but perhaps if hypoxia is beneficial, people could do um, controlled breath holding on land or, um, you know, when we're exercising, we are changing our, our respiratory physiology in ways, you know, we are, uh, that may mimic those types of things. And I think that what we're seeing there is that environmental hormesis is valuable. Certainly free divers are going to be holding their breath and having changes in respiratory physiology. Maybe that's beneficial in some ways. It's probably going to flip some switches and we know we can't overdo it. We'll drown but there's probably some benefit there. And as you suggest, I think there are other benefits in terms of heat and cold and sun exposure. And I am a big advocate for what I would call environmental hormesis over molecular hormesis, which we may or may not have time to talk about today. But I think those are good points. Going back to the Okinawan stuff, I just wanna point out something because Okinawans are often used as a model population and when I was doing the part of my book that was on blue zones, I, I came across some very interesting research that really debated the notion that Okinawans are primarily plant-based culture. I don't think anyone is debating the fact that Okinawans are a long-lived culture, but, and there are many studies to suggest that there are clustering of longevity genes in Okinawans as well, which may be accounting for this. But I came across a pretty interesting um, appraisal from 1992, and the title of the study is Nutrition for the Japanese Elderly. And what they found in this study was that high intakes of milk and fats and oils had favorable effects on the 10-year survivorship in 422 urban residents aged 69 to 70. And that um, basically what they found was that uh, nutrient intakes were compared based on 24-hour dietary records between a sample from an Okinawa prefecture where life expectancies at birth were 65 and birth and 65 were the longest in Japan and a sample from the Akita prefecture where the life expectancies were much shorter. And they say that intakes of calcium, iron, vitamins A, B1, B2, C, and the proportion of energy from protein and fat were significantly higher in the former where they had the better life expectancy than in the latter, which I thought was so interesting. And they said intake of carbohydrate was lower where they had the better life expectancy. So this is quite interesting because I think that um, so many perhaps of what we've been told about the Okinawans may be untrue. 
Another quote from that paper, the food intake pattern in Okinawa has been different from that in other regions of Japan. Uh, people there have never been influenced by Buddhism, hence there is no taboo regarding eating habits. Eating meat was not stigmatized and consumption of pork and goat was historically high. The meat intake was higher in Okinawa. They say, unexpectedly, we did not find any vegetarians among the centenarians in Okinawa. So it, quite interesting contrast. And I just, this is just my sort of counterpoint to much of what gets talked about with the blue zones that there's definitely research, at least in Okinawa and other places, Sardinia, Ikaria, that suggest these people actually eat a lot of meat. And, but what they're not doing probably like you're suggesting is not eating it all year day, all day long. They're not eating processed food and they're not, uh, and they're probably having some feast periods of famine and fasting. So it's kind of an interesting counterpoint that, um, because I think that probably one of the biggest points that you and I might disagree on is whether or not animal foods can be a part of a healthy diet long-term. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I, I hope to discuss that with you. Um, I'll, I'll point out one problem that as a scientist is really difficult and that's these confounding variables. Sure. And um, it's really hard even from scientific papers to, um, to think about what those variables might be. Um, so I had, a, I had a really interesting conversation around 2010 with Nir Barzilai at uh, uh, Albert Einstein Medical School. So he's been studying centenarians, primarily among the Ashkenazi Jewish population uh, for many decades. And um, one of the things that um, I brought up that he immediately uh, leapt on and said, hey, this, you're basically giving my theory back to me, was that in, in large scale populations, what you see is that the people who had genetic propensities for uh, cancer, heart disease, et cetera, uh, vanished from the population as the population aged. So if you would have been susceptible to um, uh, let's say overconsuming meat actually causing heart disease and cancer in you, you wouldn't be around when you were 90, when they were looking at 90 year old populations. And so in a sense, the people that you study as centenarians might have these loss of function mutations that sort of protect them. And yet um, as they age, rather than um, high amounts of meat um, just being normal for them. Uh, what you're really saying is that um, they get less value, be it IGF-1 or growth hormone or protein, et cetera, than the normal person. And so they're staving off sarcopenia and keeping their stem cells going, et cetera, on a higher amount of meat because you know they couldn't process it the same way other people could. But the people who process it very well or didn't have this loss of function mutation, um, they in fact died off. So I'm not going to suggest that this is the case. I'm gonna say um, it's really complex folks. And um, you know we have to do our best to look at the studies, to look at, in my opinion, molecular biology as, as something that points to, you know, if, if a similar mechanism like fasting works in every single organism it's ever been studied in, from bacteria to yeast to drosophila to mice to humans to all primates, et cetera, then it's really hard to say, yeah, but let's, let's ignore that. Um, so I, I think there's overwhelming evidence that this whole idea of intermittent feast and famine is really key to this longevity and, and preserving your health span. Um, and how you go about it, I think is really unclear. And I think there's, a, there's probably a vegan route, as the Loma Linda vegans have shown. There's probably a pure carnivore route, which I think the uh, native Alaskans and, and, um, and Canadians have shown us, uh, and lots of in between. And, and the key is, you know, not to be snacking on foods until 10 o'clock at night when you go to bed and then having something like, um, uh, you know, 
cereal or, or uh, pop tarts, you know, the moment you wake up uh, and to start your day. Um, we know that keeping your glycogen stores full all the time uh, keeps mTOR basically on. In the liver. And yes. Uh, right. Well, uh, it, it's, it's the glycogen stores in the liver that primarily um, control the hormones. But, but of course, you have glycogen stores in your bloodstream. Exactly. Small. You have glycogen stores in your muscles, very large amounts, uh, and some even in, in your uh, brain tissue. But, but uh, it's primarily the glycogen stores in your liver, which when they become depleted, shift you from this anabolic state exactly. to a catabolic state and turn on this self-repair mechanism, which I do think is really crucial to long-term health. And I think we totally agree on this point. And I've talked about this with Chris Masterjohn. People listening to the podcast may know that there's mTOR in the liver, mTOR in the muscles, mTOR in the kidneys. There's all these different unique mTOR locales, and there's all these different glycogen locales. And if people are interested, they should listen to the second part of the friendly debate I did with Chris Masterjohn. But in that, we talked about the fact, as you're suggesting, that when glycogen stores become depleted in the liver, we basically go into ketosis. And it's interesting to me that many people on a carnivore diet will experience this, right? They will, or low carbohydrate diets in general. And I'm, I'm not convinced that we need to be in ketosis all the time, nor am I convinced that we need to uh, chase ketone levels at the expense of muscle mass and the onset of sarcopenia. I think that's too far. I think what, I we, are, what we are doing now is navigating a murky territory. But what's so interesting to me about an animal-based diet is that we can achieve glycogen depletion in the liver. We know that people eating a carnivore diet with uh, a robust amount of protein can have some ketones in their blood from time to time, which would suggest that the liver glycogen is depleted. And as you're suggesting, if, if there are ketones in the blood from a nutritional standpoint, we are probably activating some autophagy mechanisms. Would you agree? I do agree. And, and again, like um, these other diets that we've talked about, um, ketosis is not something you should do 24-7, 365 days a year. If you keep mTOR suppressed all the time, you're going to find your white blood cell count dropping, your muscle mass decreasing, and um, uh, you're just not making proteins that your body needs for your organs to function properly. So it's, it's really crucial whatever you decide to do, whether it's... Um, turn on autophagy with ketosis or with a pure carnivore diet or as a vegan because you're limiting your leucine intake um, such that you know that trips one of the sensors that mTOR uses. Um, uh, it's really important that you give that a break and that um, uh, at some ratio, whether it's 50-50 or you know uh, three to two, um, that you turn on mTOR and you rebuild your muscle mass, you put on some weight um, because that's how we evolved. We, we, we basically evolved um, sort of as the, what's it, the, the grasshopper, you know, story about, um, you know, doing all this work before winter uh, to build up fat, to build up muscle, to build our stem cell and immune system. And then we sort of hunker down all winter. Um, that's, that's how people survived, um, you know, for millennia. And yeah, I think it, it um, going against evolution is a very dangerous proposition. Yeah. And so what's so interesting to me with regard to a carnivore diet specifically, and many people who listen to this podcast will know that I'm interested in that uh, and that I advocate for an animal-based diet. It doesn't have to be fully carnivore, but carnivore-ish, is that lots of us eating a carnivore diet don't see muscle wasting. You know, I've been able to maintain plenty of muscle. And so what I think is so fascinating and where um, I guess I would almost make the case to you and others in the space uh, is that if we do a ketogenic or a low-carbohydrate diet, a quote-unquote ketogenic diet, it's not a full ketogenic diet, I was actually talking with Gabrielle Lyon about this yesterday on a podcast that we did that we need to have a new term here. It's like intermittent ketosis. We have intermittent fasting. I think we have intermittent ketosis. On an animal-based diet, I think we are doing intermittent ketosis because when I eat breakfast in the morning, I am getting a big bolus of protein and my ketones are dropping pretty darn low. And I think at that point, I can safely say that I am getting 2.6 grams of leucine that's triggering muscle protein synthesis, which is kind of this, 
that's kind of the threshold based on what I've seen from Don Lehman and others. Like when we get that critical, critical amount of leucine, we will trigger muscle protein synthesis. And so I'm getting that in the morning. My mTOR is turning on and then it's probably on for two or three hours and then it turns off. Then I eat a second meal and that's all I do. And I try and compress that in a certain amount of time. And some days, like you're saying, I may feast and I may have three meals and I may lengthen that feeding window, but there's a real, it's quite easy. It's a very precise tool with a carnivore diet to say, I am turning mTOR on. I am not going to be in ketosis now because I'm getting enough protein. I am not an advocate for a low protein ketogenic diet. And I think that what we see when I hear the word ketogenic diets, I think of a four to one uh, fat to protein in terms of grams ratio. And that is, as you're suggesting, that is always going to have mTOR off. And I think people see muscle wasting. And I think that is where people see most of the problems is they're not getting enough protein. But isn't there um, a fascinating kind of middle ground here? And I think in some ways it's quite evolutionarily consistent. We kill an animal, we have one or two big feeds a day. Um, and I think people need to be careful with one meal a day uh, because I think that if you eat too infrequently or we compress the feeding window too much, you can get hormonal things. But isn't that kind of evolutionarily consistent to kill an animal respectfully, to have a big feed of protein to trigger mTOR, and then to have periods where you don't have that? And that would be a compressed eating window every day. So that's kind of yeah. the way I think about a carnivore diet. And it's, it's not, I'm, I'm, I'm not in ketosis all the time. I probably have very low level ketosis after I eat. And then quickly overnight, I will deplete my liver glycogen. I'll go back into ketosis and I'll get autophagy. What do you think of that strategy? That's kind of like my, that's my, uh, that's my foil. That's my well, counterpoint. I can tell you that three out of my four grandparents. Um, so, um, my grandparents on my mother's side were farmers. Um, the grandparents on my father's side, um, had an absolutely huge vegetable garden, um, that they, you know, lived off of. And, um, uh, my farmer grandparents, um, raised a lot of livestock, pigs and cattle as well, and, um, had their own, uh, animals slaughtered for them and then took that, you know, that meat back and put it in their freezers and basically lived out of their garden and their own livestock. Um, and, and you know, they, they ate a combination of, of uh, low glycemic plants from their, from their garden and a lot of healthy grass-fed, uh, pasture-fed uh, livestock. And um, they all lived to their uh, mid to late 90s. Um, and I think that um, this is much more in keeping with the uh, back to the land or, or land-based diet. And, you know, they weren't um, eating a lot of processed foods. They certainly weren't uh, getting up in the morning and having, um, you know, cereal. They were having eggs and bacon or, or you know, sausages or something like that. Um, and so I think that this key that you mentioned and I talk about in the book is really that you restrict your eating in a way that overnight you will deplete your glycogen stores. And I, personally, I... I did this as a vegan and as a vegan ketogenic person. Um, so I was completely keto um, on, a, on a vegan diet, but the key is eating very low glycemic, healthy plants and, and vegetables. So, you know, I could literally eat one to two pounds a day of Brussels sprouts or asparagus or spinach, broccoli, cauliflower, and if you look at the calories, it's minuscule, even when you're eating a pound of this stuff. And so I'm not storing a lot of glycogen and I can burn it up in one good day of, of exercise and, and overnight um, fasting and turn on autophagy on a regular basis. I think this is what my grandparents were doing with their very like sort of rural Midwestern diet of mixes of vegetables and meat. Um, and it could go in lots of different directions. If they ate more meat, if they ate less, uh, more, more vegetables. But the key being that they're not loading up with pasta, you know, um, brown rice or, or white rice or, or breads and things that stay in their digestive tract and, and essentially provide glucose all night long so that it, it's, never, um, it's never deprived. There is no famine in their life for people that, that uh, 
you know, consume these very broad windows of time from 6 a.m. to, you know, 9 p.m. Um, and then the foods that are going to be digested and uh, refilling their glycogen stores, you know, immediately. So I see people, you know, at the gym or, or out um, jogging and things like that with a Gatorade in their hand. You know, and it makes you wonder, like, well, when is their glycogen stores ever going to be depleted? In the liver, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's, yeah. I, I, I think you're totally right. I think that, I think this is a very useful metric for people. Whether or not people are eating a low carbohydrate diet, I think they could use this as a valuable metric. Get a ketone meter, get a keto mojo, no affiliation with this podcast, and check your ketones first thing in the morning. If your ketones are zero, your liver still has glycogen. Even if your ketones are trace or 0.1, you have essentially depleted your liver glycogen overnight. And many people will get to this point. You know, I did a podcast with Chris Masterjohn who eats a lot of carbohydrates. And what he was saying was that he'll have ketones of 0.2 in the morning. So even eating a high carbohydrate diet, we know that we can deplete the liver glycogen overnight. And I don't think depleting liver glycogen is a bad thing. I think as you're suggesting, it's a very useful switch and it allows our body to do a little bit of house cleaning and we probably should do it every day. Um, and so that morning ketone level, I think is very valuable. And as you're suggesting, you can do it on a plant-based diet. My concerns on a plant-based diet are the lack of other nutrients. We had, you met said something earlier that somebody could do it with a vegan shake and a leucine supplement. And I was kind of shaking my head going, no, no, no. From my perspective, that's going to miss creatine, carnitine, choline, carnosine, all the other valuable nutrients that are in meat. James, you are a brilliant man. I know you have creatine in your diet. And there are incredible studies showing that when vegetarians are given creatine back, they get smarter because we need creatine in our brain. I have so, a supplement with about 20 different proteins and amino acids personally. But what I don't wanna do is tell people, you have to follow one thing, or right. you, have to, you have to forget about your ethics, about CAFOs that we talked about, and you have to give in to this industry of killing animals and the way foods are processed and all this stuff, and just give up. Uh, I'm trying to show people that, um, there's reasonable balances that you can make in terms of eating vegan entirely if you want, but you have to switch and stay away from the higher glycemic foods um, or else you're never gonna enter this uh, catabolic state. You're never gonna get the benefits of this. And um, I think it's important that we also talk about a different type of person entirely. Uh, I mean, I can tell by looking at you and some of the photographs on the website and stuff that um, you're not an obese 300 pound, you know, 60, 70 year old man, but there's a lot of people out there. And when we talk about um, not wanting to do prolonged ketosis, actually um, for somebody that has a BMI of 40 or 50 and, um, and more than anything else, before they worry about um, one thing or another, they really need to get their BMI down to like 20s uh, and low 20s if possible. And of course, the lower, you know, up to about 18, uh, the better. Um, this is gonna make a world of difference in their morbidity and mortality rates as they age. And for them, um, this metabolic switch is crucially important. And here's the reason. When your glycogen stores are, are full, the body has evolved to prefer um, storing fat because your energy reserves are based on fat. You only have, well, as an average, 150 pound male has about 880 calories worth of glucose in their body at any given time. So, uh, that same 150 pound person is carrying about 135,000 calories of fat. And this is not an obese person. This is a healthy, you know, 150 pound person. So um, the reason we evolved to store fat when glucose was available was because, um, you know, we experienced long periods of drought, of famine, of you know, winter ice and the unavailability of, of glucose type products in our body switch to burning fat. Yes. Well, if you put that same evolved person 
into a place where just down the road is a grocery store and you can always have glucose in your bloodstream. You can always have uh, pathologically uh, high levels of glucose, you know, so that you would be pre or post diabetic um, and your glycogen stores are always full. Your body will only ever store fat. It will never burn it. And so that fat becomes senescent. It gives off terrible inflammatory cytokines. Um, the adipose tissue that is surrounding your visceral organs, like basically pollute those organs with these um, pro-inflammatory cytokines. Um, one of the most important things is, is biting that bullet and, um, and losing the weight. Um, and so I think um, ketosis, which is uh, a very non-deprived diet, so it allows you to eat. Um, you know, 1,500 to 2,000 calories a day, as long as 65% or more of it is from fats. And I would urge people to, to do healthy fats, um, you know, not vegetable, not vegetable oils and, and uh, you know, certainly not trans fats and things like that. Um, and teach their body how to burn fat again and, um, and to get down to a BMI that, um, would be proven to be much more healthy. I couldn't so, agree with, yeah, I'm sorry so, to interrupt so that, you. That's my one qualification about like, we don't want to do ketosis day in and day out. Some people might need to do ketosis for a year. Yeah, and you know, in that situation, what I would recommend would be something like a protein sparing modified fast where, because I think the maintenance of lean muscle mass is so important and I would not fear the protein in that person. And when, if I have somebody with a BMI of 40 or 50, I want them to maintain their lean muscle mass. And I probably still would not put them on a high uh, or a, a classical ketogenic diet because I want them to maintain their muscle mass. But we could do a protein sparing modified fast, which is essentially rabbit starvation. So it's, it's moderate to high protein with very low fat and very low carbs. This is a disaster long term, but if somebody has excess body fat storage, it can lead to loss of that body fat and uh, improvement in insulin sensitization very quickly. And so that, that's how I would approach that, giving somebody adequate protein, probably within a controlled feeding window during the day, because what I well, the way I would see it is let's give somebody good quality animal protein that has all of the other nutrients that we need, right? The zinc, the carnitine, the choline, the carnosine that are missing in plants. And then the rest of the, and then give it to them in a small window, trigger the maintenance of lean muscle mass. And then the rest of the time, don't give them a whole lot of carbohydrates or fat, and then they will lose the fat in that way. Again, I don't think we have to chase ketones. I think in that person, they will have higher ketones and they, they, but there will be a part of the day where they will replenish some of that liver glycogen and when you give them 100 grams of protein or 150 grams of protein a day. And personally, I wouldn't worry about that. I think that would be probably the best way to do it so they maintain that lean muscle mass because we know the lean muscle mass is necessary for insulin sensitization, right? It's where we dispose of that glucose. And if we lose the lean muscle mass, we're essentially losing our chi. So I did a podcast with Gabrielle Lyon and we talked about this kind of jokingly that in a video game, you know, you have that little bar at the top with your life force. And I think of lean muscle mass as our life force. And if we're losing lean muscle mass, we are doing something wrong, period, right? And so that's, I think, the key in any of these things. We don't want to lose uh, any of that lean muscle mass. So that's, I, I agree with you. I think losing the weight would be super important. And I would do it not fearing protein, but using the protein in a controlled manner right? Not feeding them protein all, all day long. Yeah. But, and I, I want to highlight something else you said, which I think is super important. And this is echoing a theme that's come up on a number of my podcasts recently, that when liver glycogen stores are full, we tend to store fat. And so I think that for people, they need to be very aware that this is kind of how human metabolism works. It's oversimplification. But if our liver glycogen stores are full and we eat fat, we could store the fat if it's an excess of calories and we're not burning it off in a day. It's really that simple. And so what I have seen and what we do see is that some people will, um, will not gain weight eating lots of carbohydrates. Well, if they're eating lots of carbohydrates, their liver glycogen is always full, but if they're very low fat, they won't store the fat. You have to kind of, you know, if, you, if there's overfeeding studies with carbohydrates showing that we won't really store 
um, the fat to any significant degree. De novo lipogenesis doesn't really happen if we're eating mostly carbs. But right. as we're saying, eating a lot of carbs is probably not a good idea because you want that liver glycogen to be low sometimes. You want there to be autophagy. But in terms of weight loss, that strategy can work, a high carb, low fat diet. I'm not advocating for that. But the reverse, I think, is what we are both advocating for, which is a higher fat, lower carbohydrate diet. Um, and I would say uh, I would want people to have a robust amount of protein on that diet. And that is going to deplete liver glycogen, get autophagy, preserve lean muscle mass, and not have the issues with storing. But it's the combination of carbohydrates and fat, I think evolutionarily, that is, is um, uh, short-circuiting our, our metabolism as humans. What, what do you think of all that? Yeah, I, I, I generally agree with all that. Although I, I, my personal experience is that I've also done a, what would probably be a calorie restricted uh, pure vegan diet. Uh, and the fact is, is that you can only eat so many pounds of Brussels sprouts a day. And so um, what, you're, what you find then is um, you're barely topping up the glycogen stores because there's just not a lot of, you know, there's a lot of fiber, there's, there's not a lot of, uh, of uh, easy digested carbs in what you're eating. And so I could still end up in ketosis the next day eating just some legumes and, and, uh, and very low glycemic vegetables. Um, but, you know, I also do a lot uh, of exercise. So on average, I walk between five and eight miles a day. Um, you know, it takes a, a good chunk of time, a couple hours um, to get this kind of exercise in every day. But I also know that you know this is a good way for me to to burn through um, my glucose, to lower my blood sugar, to um, uh, of course help keep my my muscle mass, etc. So um, uh, again, I think there's lots of ways to skin the cat metaphorically, and um, um, it, you know people can can especially through uh, self testing. Um, glucose levels and, and ketone levels and um, going to uh, getting blood panels that, that show IGF-1 levels, et cetera. I, I think that they can, over time, optimize this and, and help, um, help make sure that they're not uh, uh, doing something harmful in the process of trying to uh, regulate this, this switch. Um, one of the things I'm a big advocate of are DEXA scans. And I, I've now used them in um, a lot of my clinical trials or anti-aging clinical trials. So it's a very low dose X-ray. Um, it's given uh, or it's, uh, it's utilized by a lot of bodybuilders. I didn't know this, but, but uh, the main clientele of a lot of these companies that have these mobile DEXA scan vehicles is to go around to um, like championship weightlifting and, and other uh, athletic events because the athletes want to, want to see what their uh, fat levels are, what their uh, lean muscle mass levels are. And the sexo scans show you precisely where in the body the fat's located um, and um, whether or not um, your, your right side's more muscular than your left side. and um, it could show you that you, you know you're missing out, like like wow, you've really developed your upper arms and, and your chest, but you have you know puny muscles in your legs, or vice versa. Um, so they're they're really interesting. Um, and in my case, I found out that despite being fairly lean looking, uh, kind of tall and thin, um, uh, I had uh, undesirably high levels of adipose tissue. Uh, called VAT, vascular adipose tissue, around my organs. The visceral, so, the visceral adipose so, tissue. Visceral yeah. adipose tissue. And so I went, um, I went on a uh, intermittent fasting. So I normally do time restricted dieting, we, which we can talk about later. Um, but I stopped my once a day meal uh, on noon Friday, and I wouldn't have another meal until noon Monday. So I would get. Uh, essentially um, two full days of fasting in every week. And in less than three uh, months, um, I lost uh, approximately 11 pounds. So I went from 165 pounds to 145 roughly. Um, 
over a, a greater period of time, but, but I lost about 11 pounds of, uh, of fat and gained um, seven pounds of muscle because I was also focused on, on working out during that same time period. Um, so, um, you know, this, this kind of micromanaging your, your uh, health by getting this uh, cool data about, um, you know, your, your fat levels, your, your uh, bone density levels, uh, your muscle levels, et cetera, I think is really helpful. I think DEXA scans are super valuable, and I think people should look at their VAT, their visceral adipose tissue. Interestingly, I do this on a lot of my clients on a carnivore diet, and theirs is very low. So I think it has to do with insulin sensitivity, and I think that's what you were saying, that, that when we become insulin resistant, we will store fat in the visceral compartment. This is exactly what we were talking about. If liver glycogen is full and we overeat on fat, um, we will store that fat as visceral tissue. And that is an indication that you are insulin resistant because the body is saying, hey, I have more nutrients than I need. I'm going to create, uh, you know, the citrate is going to move out of the mitochondria into the cytosol. It's going to do de novo lipogenesis. You're going to get signals. You're going to get reactive oxygen species generated in the mitochondria. And that is the beginning of adipose tissue. The body puts the brakes on nutrients coming into the mitochondria and you store it, the de novo lipogenesis and the the triglycerides from the food we eat or the fat from the food we eat is stored as visceral adipose tissue. So during that time, did you check your fasting insulin? Did your fasting insulin also improve during that time? Because if you had extra VAT, extra visceral adipose tissue, I would wonder about your markers of insulin sensitivity. My insulin levels have, have almost always been under 100. Um, so I, I, I haven't really seen... Um, um, insulin resistant so much uh, as a problem, at least over the last couple of decades. I think maybe when I was in my 30s and uh, was eating kind of a high glycemic uh, vegetarian and, and vegan diet, um, I, I think I probably uh, came close to approaching the diabetic level. Um, but um, after essentially learning about the glycemic index uh, I think that was in the late 1980s, or early 90s, when I when I really uh, uh, got that information. Um, and changing my diet, I've I've had relatively low um, fasting blood sugar and low insulin levels, and relatively low IGF-1 levels um, on a whole. What, what is your? You said your fasting insulin was less than 100. Did you mean fasting glucose? No, fasting fasting insulin. Because the fasting insulin levels uh, I see yeah, are usually not, less. Sorry. Than yeah. Yeah. Go, go ahead. I, I, I was thinking about something else. I'm sorry. Okay. Do you know I your... was thinking about my IGF-1 levels. Oh, yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. That's valuable though. So your IGF-1 is less than 100. I've definitely seen that in people like 90s. And then what is your fasting insulin? Do you know, I usually see like below five or even below four. Um, I, I don't actually recall. Uh, so I, I get my um, whole blood panels done about every two months. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, as I said, I kind of micromanage it, but uh, I don't uh, really uh, focus too much on that mm -hmm. because they're all within like the lowest of the healthy ranges. That's great. Um, for sort of where I want to keep things. Yeah. Um, and I'm also concerned about AGEs. And uh, my personal observation of this, um, which I think differs from uh, a lot of other researchers and especially nutritionists, is that um, you know they talk a lot about uh, burning food and the AGEs, advanced glycation end products that you get from um, cooking food or overcooking food, and how harmful that is to uh, your health. But I I believe that high blood sugar uh, and the glyc uh, uh, the um, Glycation of proteins in your endothelial lining, meaning your blood veins, is probably the number one AGE problem that uh, Westerners suffer from. Hardening of the arteries caused by essentially um, this glucose molecules latching onto every area of protein that they can get their hands on. And, um, you know, if you have ever seen how a creme brulee is made where you heat up sugar and it forms this glass-like substance, that's basically glycation. And, um, you know, these sugar molecules are, are cross-linking and the same thing happens in your bloodstream, the proteins. Uh, 
and it's, it's very detrimental. Um, and there's not much we can do about it except lowering our blood sugar. And so, again, this constant state of glycogen reserves are full, um, your blood, blood glucose is, you know, 110 or higher, and um, uh, no end in sight, um, meaning that, that you don't go through periods of fasting and, and lower this back down, is that you end up with um, the inner lining of your blood vessels uh, being essentially glass coated with, with sugar. Not a good thing. Yeah, I think that the, the endogenous formation of AGEs is, is more of a factor than the exogenous consumption. I've talked about this on a few podcasts in the past. If we look at foods, butter is quite high in AGEs. I think we have to be maybe careful of that. I don't think we know exactly how much the dietary contribution is. Bacon is high in AGEs. I'm not, I don't advocate for people frying foods, defrying their meats, cooking their meats in oil, just to potentially uh, avoid the exogenous consumption of AGEs. But I think you're right. I think it's the endogenous inside of our body formation of AGEs that is the most damaging to us. I think the indicators that this is happening are things like the median or the mean amplitude glucose excursions. So the mages, the postprandial glucose excursions, which we can see. Um, and we know that postprandial glucose excursions, these mage events are correlated with endothelial dysfunction, probably because of these glycation end products that are forming in our blood. And so that's what's so interesting also for me about a carnivore diet is that when we look at a CGM, a continuous glucose monitor, we don't get any postprandial glucose elevations. It's a flat line. And yeah. I wish there were a better way to measure endogenous AGE formation. I've talked with a few people about potentially getting, you can get these like ultraviolet um, detectors of AGEs for your skin. And I would love to see how that's changing on a carnivore diet and, you know, yeah. test the I hypothesis. Used, I've used one of those machines and it was, it was not reliable. Uh, I won't, won't tell which one, but, but um, uh, unfortunately, I don't think there's really a really uh, credible um, AGE reader uh, mm -hmm. machine, you know, available yet. Um, I think the best proxy would probably be the postprandial glucose. So I think if people are worried about this, I love what we're doing here and I'll just outline it for people. I feel like we're kind of constructing uh, a series of metrics that people can use. You know, we talked about IGF-1. You know, you want to see that below the mean. You probably want to see it around 100 or 120. And if it's higher than that, it's probably too high. We talked about fasting glucose. We talked about fasting insulin. I think people should also be checking, uh, doing a CGM at at least one point in their life, doing a continuous blood glucose monitor. I think you can also check um, inflammatory markers. And if you don't want to do a CGM, you can do a uh, just a, a finger blood stick uh, finger stick glucose postprandially and compare that to your fasting glucose and look for that postprandial excursion to get a sense of the AGEs. And I feel like with all those metrics, we would get a sense of the clock, you know, and, and get fasting ketones in the morning. You could tell liver glycogen, you could tell, um, you know, where your IGF-1 is. You can tell essentially what your overall mTOR is looking like, at least in the morning when you're fasting. And you could get a sense of this glycation happening when you're after eating. I think if people use those metrics alone, they could get a really good sense of how they're doing. What do you think of that suggestion? Well, I totally agree. Um, one of the AGE measurements that we've left out so far is hemoglobin A1C, which is actually a glycation measurement. Um, doctors primarily use it to to look at um, your total blood sugar levels over a three month period, including, you know, postprandial spikes. Um, but it's, it, it is actually a direct measurement of glycation. Um, so it's a really handy, um, very inexpensive test. Um, most doctors can do it right in their office on a machine that, you know, they have in their office. So um, uh, I personally have now for six, five to six years, taking my fasting glucose every single day of my life. And for many years, I took as many as 10 finger pricks a day. And this is not as a diabetic at all, but simply because I wanted to know what everything I was putting into my mouth or other uh, things that were happening to me, um, what that did to blood sugar. And I'll tell you one of the most interesting things. So um, short digression. Um, I bought a seven acre property to build a laboratory on just outside of uh, the University of Florida in Gainesville. 
I moved here from Los Angeles recently. And this property had uh, a huge forest of trees and I needed to take down some of them because you know, Florida has hurricanes. Um, the possibility that we would lose electricity because a tree, one of many trees, would fall over a power line and cut off our electricity for some period of time before it could, it could get repaired um, meant that we could lose hundreds of blood samples. So I ended up personally cutting down about 100 or more uh, big trees. And um, some of them, because I've got three buildings on the property, including residents, uh, were precariously close to um, if I cut it the wrong way or the wind happens to blow just at the right time, it could just destroy my lab building or my house or my carport, etc. So interestingly enough, um, I checked my glucose levels after cutting down a couple of these really sort of high stress tense, tense filled uh, trees. And uh, my morning fasting glucose was let's say 85, which would be normal for me. And I had no breakfast, just had a little coffee, which is normal for me. Uh, no dairy or anything else in the coffee, just, just black coffee. And then I went out and did some work. And in these especially stressful mornings, I went back and measured my blood glucose, and it was 140. And what I, what I discovered was that um, uh, cortisone, the stress hormone, actually um, triggers this whole fight, fight or flight syndrome. And so your liver um, recognizes uh, this, these uh, cortisol levels and says basically, okay, something really bad is about to happen. This guy is tremendously stressed out. I'm gonna prepare by producing a heck of a lot of glucose from protein. And so my, my liver would flood my body with glucose. Um, in this preparation of, you know, saber-toothed tiger's been spotted and we don't quite know where it is or, you know, some uh, fight is about to erupt out and, you know, this guy may need to, like, um, fight or run for his life. So um, I, I was really surprised to see that stress did this. And so I, I started measuring glucose after other stressful events. Um, uh, even if this was, you know, preparing for a podcast day or something. And sure enough, my blood glucose levels go up. So um, it turns out that you can take um, uh, DHEA, um, which is the sort of yin for yang for, for cortisol, and, um, or it's the um, glucagon to insulin type of, of, uh, of yin and yang, so to speak. That, um, that it basically suppresses this stress response. And so I would take um, 25 to 50 milligrams of DHEA in the morning and then purposefully go do something really stressful that I don't like to do and my blood sugar levels would just be normal. Um, so um, I think there's a whole lot that um, as scientists we can learn about um, uh, the ways in which we harm our body and the ways that stress harms it uh, and the way that, you know, certain types of stress benefit it. And uh, I'm really excited that, you know, this kind of information is going to be available really soon to people to, to make use of. I think that's interesting. It's like blunting the response. I definitely think that it's important for us as humans to have adequate levels of androgens in our bodies. And um, I wonder, yeah. If, we, if we're making enough androgens, perhaps, or the corollary is probably more true or more relevant to this discussion, that if we're making inadequate levels of androgens, could that lead to um, overactive cortisol responses or um, problems with blood glucose control? Yeah, that's fascinating. And I do think that that's important with blood glucose. But um, I think that um, before we wrap up, I know you've got to go in a moment. Maybe we should talk a little bit about um, a few points in the book that that I just would like to um, point and counterpoint with you, if that's okay. Um, there, was, there, was a, um, there was a point in the book where you said that too much protein harmed the kidneys. And I was wondering what you were basing that on because I've seen a number of studies that, that argue against that. And I, I think that basically what I am 
hearing in this conversation is that you and I agree on a lot. And I just don't want people to be afraid of protein. I think we need to use protein judiciously, but it, I think that it's a crucial part of human diets. And I think we should not vilify animal protein. So I'm wondering what you're basing the statement that animal protein or excess protein is hard on the kidneys on. I'm really talking about like tremendous overconsumption. Mm -hmm. So bodybuilder levels of, of you know, um, consuming, you know, uh, massive amounts of protein in the, in the, in the, what I think is mistaken belief that more is always better. Uh, and again, um, uh, there is literature showing that, uh, you know, potassium is also high with, with, uh, um, uh, certain, uh, dairy and meat intake that, um, uh, potassium, uh, can be uh, detrimental when people have um, kidney problems and that that can exacerbate. And that in some cases, when people have chronic kidney illness, um, that um, reducing the amount of in intake seems to make it beneficial. Um, again, I think there's all kinds of ways around this. And I'm not a physician, so I don't see patients and I don't have to advise them about this sort of thing but it's come up in the literature that I've read over and over. So I wanna put this warning out there, only that um, I don't think that it's a, a great idea to say, you know, if um, 70 grams of protein is good, then 700 grams of protein is even better. Um, and that there, there is limits, um, and even the, um, even the Inuits and Eskimos reported the same thing, that um, overconsumption of protein hurt them, and um, you know they would they would focus also on on consuming healthy fats as opposed to only consuming meat. And um, uh, again, from the diaries of the uh, of the individuals on the uh, Lewis and Clark ex expedition, they also said that when they only had um, uh, very lean meat to eat um, that they actually got ill, um, you know, from, from going weeks on in with the only thing they could eat was like, you know, extremely um, uh, lean rabbit, for example. Uh, and they didn't have, you know, other foods to eat, so they ate what they had to eat. Um, so that, that was my only point in bringing that up. And I don't think I have any... Um, numbers, you know, that, that I could say definitively, this is safe, this is not safe. It's, it's just sort of a cautionary um, uh, word. Yeah, and I think you're absolutely right. Um, there are many uh, accounts of people overeating protein in the absence of fat. So this is essentially rabbit starvation. When Willemar Stephenson went into Bellevue Hospital, in the beginning, they tried to feed him a lot of lean meat and he got sick. And the Inuit, if they're eating lots of lean meat, they get sick and the Lewis and Clark explorers get sick. But I think that if we're getting enough fat or carbohydrates, and again, I think it's very clear from this podcast that both of us would favor fat over carbohydrates. If we're getting enough fat, I think that humans, there's plenty of good evidence to suggest that humans can eat a pretty robust amount of protein without any problems. Um, I'll just cite a couple of studies so that people are not fearful here. So one of them is the, uh, the Journal of Nutrition and uh, nutrition and disease changes in kidney function do not differ between healthy adults consuming higher compared with lower or normal protein diets, a systematic review and meta-analysis. And then there's another study, um, comparison, comparative effects of low carbohydrate, high protein versus low fat diets on the kidney. And neither of those studies found any dangers to a higher protein diet. The conclusions of the second study were that in healthy obese individuals, a lower, a low carbohydrate, High protein weight loss diet over two years was not associated with noticeably harmful effects on GFR, albuminuria, or, or fluid and electrolyte balance compared with a low fat diet. Um, so that's that's. I think it's just important to point out that um, that protein is not in and of itself damaging to the kidneys. And when people have chronic kidney disease, that's a different story. If they can't actually excrete the the byproducts, it can be a problem. But in people who have normal renal function, I don't think we should fear the protein. So, well, again, a lot of people that, that I'm trying to help uh, to slow down aging for are people in their 80s and 90s. And so you, you do run into a, a, 
uh, a greater number of people who have uh, kidney dysfunction. And I just want to exercise uh, caution with those yeah. people. Yeah, it's delicate. I think that what we're dealing with now is the land of nuance and we're trying to find the sweet spot. You know, um, for me, uh, what I've recommended to people is I think a gram of protein uh, per pound of body weight is pretty safe for people, which is a lot more than most people would eat, but I'm not recommending two grams per pound of body weight or three or 400 wow. grams of protein. Uh, from what I've heard uh, and what I've seen, there's really no benefit beyond a gram of protein per pound of body weight per day for people. That's plenty of protein to maintain lean muscle mass. And I think you're absolutely right. Excess protein beyond that will, will probably cause uh, hyperaminemia or overload the urea cycle in the liver to metabolize the amino acids. But I think we also should not go too low and that may be where, where the nuance is. So um, do you, well, again, I, guess, I, I, yeah. I really prefer talking about cycling and, um, and cycling this uh, higher and lower uh, to make sure that we are getting into stages of uh, autophagy. Um, but again, uh, not staying there forever either. Um, we need to cycle back and forth because that's essentially how we evolve. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think then the question becomes maybe by, or the, the, the way forward might be watching the other metrics, watching the IGF-1, the ketones, uh, and the CGM and the, the fasting blood glucose uh, to really get a sense of how, what the time frame is to cycle that. Is yeah. cycling on a daily basis enough? You know, that's kind of the way that I'm living now. And I, I, uh, I wonder if that's enough, you know, so I'm having a controlled feeding window during the day where I'm getting lots of protein and then I'm not getting protein for 16 or 18 hours a day. And so is that enough? Is that not enough? Should I cycle a longer period? And I think that if we're watching the metrics like hormones, uh, in addition to these other things, we'll, we'll start to see where, where the sweet spot is. And I think that we agree. We just may not um, see eye to eye on what the time frame is for the cycling. And scientifically, what I've seen is that um, there are certain levels of autophagy and things that get turned on that only get turned on with prolonged fasting. And so having an occasional, even if it's just once a year, three day fast or four day fast, et cetera, could be really beneficial. Um, so um, I'm a total advocate of the overnight fasting and having uh, mTOR suppressed and autophagy on, you know, when you wake up in the morning. Um, but I'm not so sure that there's not additional benefit to be gained from occasional short-term prolonged fasts, like, yeah. like, you know, three to four days. Yeah. I think that there may be unique benefits there, but as we talked about, if we overdo them, it could be, could be damaging for us. Yeah. So I agree. Some dangerous ways. And I just want to highlight one thing about Loma Linda, because we talked about Loma Linda. Have you seen the study in Loma Linda where they looked at the sperm quality of people in Loma Linda? It's quite striking. So I, I've discussed this study in the past, um, and I just want to point out to people that uh, I am not a fan of Loma Linda as a blue zone. I think it was incorrectly characterized as a blue zone. But the, the title of the study is Food Intake, Diet, and Sperm Characteristics in a Blue Zone, a Loma Linda Study. What they found was that in people, uh, because only about half the population in Loma Linda is lacto-ovo vegetarian uh, or vegan. And in those people, there were much lower quality sperm. They said vegans had the lowest hyperactive motility um, with uh, of sperm, so they, vegans had the most uh, sort of languid sperm, and um, they had the lowest numbers between them. And so I think this is also a cautionary tale um, against some of these blue zones. And to complement that, I'll just point out that there's a great study, Lifestyle and Reduced Mortality Among Active California Mormons, 1980 to 2004, which shows that the Mormons in California have the same improvements in life expectancy as the people in Loma Linda, and yet the Mormons don't shun the meat. So um, whenever anyone points out or tries to um, associate the lack of meat in the Loma Linda diet with longevity, I at least offer that as a, um, as a counterpoint. I think that um, based on what I've seen in Blue Zones, uh, it's a lot of genetics and people doing things that are very meaningful to them. And as we talked about earlier, I think it's pretty hard to make a characterization that it's the meat or the absence of meat that's really leading to this. But I, I agree with you that it certainly could be the absence of snacking and the absence of junk food and the absence of eating all day long. So, yeah. Well, 
I so appreciate you coming on the podcast. We've covered a wide range of things. I think that I'll just wrap up with a few questions and just to kind of clarify and summarize for people. So, and you can answer this question honestly. So with a carnivore diet, like, like we've constructed it here, you know, thinking about a bolus of meat in the morning and one in the afternoon, you know, maybe a six or eight hour compressed feeding window, enough, you know, protein to maintain adequate muscle mass. We're going to deplete liver glycogen overnight. We're going to get autophagy. What do you think about that strategy for longevity? And, you know, what, what do you think about a carnivore diet in that sense? I, I think um, the carnivore diet you've described is entirely uh, within the range of what I would say could become a very healthy diet. Um, I don't think it's exclusively the healthiest diet, sure. um, but it's certainly um, as an elimination diet of getting rid of, you know, all the bad things that, you know, fill 90% of grocery stores. I think it's terrific. Um, and um, I think there's a lot to be said for the simplicity as well. Um, Cause uh, you know, I, I get questioned about this all the time that, that, you know, Nutrition information is really scary. Um, people hear all kinds of stuff coming from marketers. Um, this is good. That is good. You know, um, they should stay away from saturated fat. They should eat more carbohydrates. And then, you know, they're loading up with um, sugary drinks and, and Pop-Tarts. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm all for uh, things which um, are easy to follow and eliminate the, the, the worst of the fast foods and, and um, uh, high glycemic carbs, et cetera. So I, I would be okay with that. And I, I think that it's, um, it is interesting because, you know, I've had conversations with other people in the space and um, I, I, I want to take those things into account as we're thinking about this. It's a type of diet that I try to refine. Um, I don't think it's the only way for people to be healthy. Um, I'm not a big fan of plant-based diets because of the lack of uh, bioavailable nutrients and the need for uh, pretty extreme supplementation. But I think there are lots of ways for humans to be healthy eating some plants. In the book, I offer kind of a carnivore-ish diet perspective. But I do think it's important that people hear not to be afraid of animal protein. Like when we're really getting down to it, there's, there's not a lot of evidence to suggest that we should fear animal protein. I think it's more important or perhaps more, um, more effective to, to realize that that's a powerful medicine that we should use at certain times of the day and not overconsume and have fasting, but that, uh, that animal protein itself is not harmful to humans. I just think that that's going to cause suffering for people long-term. Um, yeah, I'm going to have to go soon, but I, I did want to bring up one study. I don't know if you came across this in your research, um, but it was, it was quite interesting to me because the study was about meat eaters, and it compared the diets of meat eaters to, to people with reduced meat intake and then no in, intake, etc. And the crazy thing about this particular paper was that it showed that at least in the population that were, you know, self-describing their diets, the people who were in the highest quantile of, of, of meat consumption were also in the highest quantile of every consumption. They were also eating the most fat, the most carbohydrates, et cetera, of every group. Um, and so they were just simply over consumers. Yes. And I think some people have focused on studies that show that, um, uh, meat eaters are less healthy, is that um, what they can't tease out of those subjects is, um, were they not only eating a lot of meat, but also all the same amount of, of um, carbohydrates as everybody else too, on top of the meat and on top of like a high fat diet. So yes, exactly. Um, so so I, think, I think we have to be nuanced about some of these uh, papers and we have to um, in my case, I think go back to the molecular biology that we share with even plants and, and bacteria um, that basically tell us that we need to undergo this um, uh, back and forth of the metabolic switch mTOR and to turn on autophagy once in a while. I totally agree. And I so appreciate all of your work. And I appreciate you coming on the podcast. The last question you can answer briefly, I don't want to keep you, but what is the most radical thing that you have done recently, my friend? <laughs> 
uh, in terms of research. And in uh, terms of well, life, just in terms of life, like 80s radical, neon lights, radical. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm completely focused on anti-aging for the last few years. My parents are both alive. They're in their late 80s. Um, I've seen what happens to people, um, you know, as they enter their, you know, ninth decade. And um, I'm really trying to figure out ways to slow their aging because I, I believe that, as we call it, indefinite lifespans or health spans is just around the corner. And it would be a shame that lots of people that we know and love or, or appreciate um, aren't going to make it uh, the extra five or 10 years um, that will bridge them to what uh, Aubrey de Grey, a longevity expert, calls uh, longevity escape velocity, meaning that for every year that you live, um, medical science has given you two more years of a future lifespan. And uh, I think we're really close to that. That's an exciting future. And we'll have to, I'd love to have you back on the podcast soon to talk about all of your other work with senescent cells. And we didn't even get a chance to talk about NAD. Lots to talk about, but thanks for coming on. And uh, I look forward to hopefully hanging out with you in Florida soon. And maybe I convince you to have a steak with me. You bet. Thank you, Paul. I really enjoyed the conversation. All right. All right. All right. That was a fun one. I appreciate James Clement coming on and spending the time with me really trying to dig as deep as we could into a lot of these molecular mechanisms. I appreciate that he was willing to have this double-sided conversation, that I was able to offer some points and counterpoints, and hopefully this was helpful for you guys. I think that the longevity stuff is super important, and we should be definitely activating mTOR sometimes, and then not activating mTOR sometimes, just like our ancestors would have, and that's probably the key. I don't think we need to overcomplicate it. I certainly do not fear animal protein in this process, and I am always happy to offer competing opinions with those who believe animal protein may be damaging for humans because, come on, that's just crazy. It's not. No way. It's not bad for us. There's really no evidence of that. And, and people who are saying otherwise, I believe, are a little bit misled and confused in this point. When you guys hear this podcast, I will be returning from Austin, Texas, where I was over the weekend. I did some hunting with my friends, and we were out there in the wilderness doing respectful, spiritual grateful gathering of animals as we are meant to. And I excitedly will tell you about that stuff in the near future. You can check my Instagram for stories about all that stuff. But that is the main thing that is going on with me. And as I said in the beginning of the podcast, we are one week closer to the release of my book, which I am super excited about. The Carnivore Code is coming. The Carnivore Code is coming for you all. And I'm so stoked to share it soon. You can please leave me a review for this podcast on iTunes and other outlets. It's doing radically. Uh, what else would you expect, right? And speaking of radical, I have a t-shirt now, which is on my website. You can go to carnivoremd.com in the top menu bar. There's a tab for merchandise where you can find my t-shirt. It says stay radical on the front and I'll let you look it up and see what it says on the back, but it's a surprise. I'll be posting about it on social media soon, but that's my t-shirt and the book and you can sign up for my newsletter on my website and please check out whiteoakpastures.com. I really want to see you all at White Oak Chella. Last year, there were about 90 people there. This year, we're expecting double that number and it sounds like my buddy Ken Barry is going to be there. And it sounds like Dr. Mercola is going to come and hang out as well. So we're going to have a star studded cast for White Oak Cello this year. It'll probably just sell out. So once we advertise, you guys should get your tickets, reserve a space, come hang out in Bluffton, Georgia, the celebration of regenerative agriculture. Check out Ancestral Supplements for your gelatin encapsulated grass fed, grass finished organs. And Check out nativedeodorant.com, Saladino, for 20% off of that one. If you want to coat your armpits in something that is not chemical-laden and still smell lovely. All right, you guys, enjoy the week ahead of you. Crush it, stay radical, and let me know how I can make this podcast better. I appreciate you all, and I will see you soon. Mm-hmm.